Well, I think we'll make a start. Good afternoon and welcome to our open lecture. Um, we're covering music therapy case studies this afternoon. And I just want to mention a couple of bits before we get started. If you wouldn't mind keeping your microphones muted, uh, that would be great. Um, we'll allow time for Q&A at the end, uh, time permitting. And if you wouldn't mind typing your questions into the chat, that would be really helpful. We'll keep an eye on the questions during the lecture. We may answer them directly in the chat, or if we think they need further discussion, we'll address them at the end. Uh, we're recording the talk, um, so you will be able to watch it again at a later date, uh, but we won't be filming delegates, just so you're aware. I'm gonna hand you over now to our first speaker, Roseanne, and I'll let her introduce herself in a little bit more detail. Hi there everyone, thank you very much for attending a, a Music Therapy Open Lecture. So just a little bit about the RHN in the Royal Hospital for Neurodisability is a charitable hospital providing rehabilitation in a brain injury service and it also has a nursing home for adults with neurodisabilities. It has a number of therapeutic professions including that of music therapy. So this is just a little bit of an overview of what music therapy is. It's a profession that's uh, regulated by the Health and Care Professions Council. And we provide input across a number of different domains. So that's including physical work, uh, cognition, speech work and communication, and also emotional, emotional based work. There, sometimes we use neurologic music therapy techniques here which is um, a set of research-based techniques. And the methods we use include instrumental improvisation, song singing, songwriting, and quite a bit of use of music technology. So without further ado, I'm going to uh, pass it over to, to the team. We're going to show you three separate case studies of different work. And as Jess said, you know, there'll be questions, uh, time for questions at the end. So I'm going to introduce you to Amanda Thorpe and she's going to give the first case study. Hello everyone and welcome to the open lecture. So um, I'm going to be talking about some songwriting that has been conducted at the RHN and um, to start with I'm just going to try and play a sample of one such song. I'm going to skip forward a bit so that we can get to it. Oops, no I'm not. You may just have to listen to the beginning. Let's try again. Thank you for listening. Um, so, Ali was found unconscious at the bottom of the stairs by her son. She was taken to hospital where a brain tumour was identified and subsequently removed. I'm just going to have a technical pause because there is an echo. I'm not sure it's coming out of the computer. Maybe that's. I'm so okay, it stopped. Thank you. Sorry, technical error. Back to Ali. 
So she was diagnosed with brain tumour, which was subsequently removed. So brain tumours make up approximately 3 to 5% of acquired brain injury admissions. So whilst it's a significantly small proportion, the impact is no less significant. And in comparison, brain tumours are also the biggest cancer killer of children and adults under 40. She came to the RHN for 12 weeks of level one rehabilitation. And on arrival, she was independently mobile. However, she was unstable and required a lot of support with transfers and standing and walking. Her language was intact. However, her cognition had been impacted, causing difficulty with planning, organization, problem solving. She also had um, reduced insight and impulse control. She was verbally and socially disinhibited and would often shout at the other patients on the ward. And um, with the therapist, she would immediately share extensive personal information. One can only speculate on whether or not the tumour had actually impacted her behaviour prior to its discovery, as she had separated with her husband a few years prior to the tumour being diagnosed. She had also had very sporadic work and um, was in disagreements with her landlord. Her boys had also commented that her mood had changed prior to the diagnosis. So Ali loved to sing and dance. And when I started working with her, we were using preferred songs as a way to support conscious, controlled movements of her limbs, upper and lower limbs and body awareness. But Ali would quickly direct the session into complaining about her ex-husband, the other patients on the ward, her frustrations with being in hospital when she felt she was independently able to walk and talk. Um, so I suggested maybe we should write a song about it. She was a little sceptical, she'd never written a song before, but she was also receptive to the idea. So that's what we started to do. So as we walked to the session room, we'd chat and we'd catch up about what was on her mind. And I'd observe her gait, was she walking fastly, slow, was she hunched over, was she standing up? What was her energy like? And when we got to the room, we'd select a couple of instruments and then I'd just start to play something. I'd see how she responded, whether she sort of perked up or whether she sort of got disinterested in what we were doing, if she started to move her body. And then I'd incorporate some of the words that she'd actually said to me as we'd been walking to the room. This seemed to take her aback. And you could see that she was acknowledging and recognising that what I was singing was actually what she had said. And this seemed to spark an interest and curiosity in the process. What had initially seemed inaccessible to her, as in songwriting, now seemed possible. And she suddenly got a burst of confidence and started singing and making up lyrics. The approach varied across the different sessions and we started improvising, we started playing with rhythms, we started with words, um, we started with just talking, we had rhyming games. And eventually over the course of several sessions, we built up a body of um, songs that were exploring very different um, emotionally poignant um, subjects for her. We ended up recording the songs and um, the song that you heard at the beginning was me singing, but then Ali would record her voice over the track and then we'd remove my voice and then she would have a clean version of the song with just her singing. This also extended into um, cross-disciplinary work where she was able to start doing CD designs with artwork and um, she also could print out the lyrics and make a little booklet and that was something that she could take home with her. So on reflection, Ali initially approached the therapy sessions as, you know, a bit of fun and entertainment, a bit like her grandmother who had said to her, oh, it sounds like you're on holiday at hospital, you're doing, having a pedicure, you're having a manicure, you're doing art, you're singing and dancing. And that, that was where the um, hospital holiday idea had initiated. Um, however, as we pursued the songwriting process, the different layers of the therapy intervention became increasingly apparent and important to her. We explored several areas of concern, as I mentioned, whether it was her illness, her loss of um, uh, sort of being physically able. Um, her family was far away. Her boys were here. 
Um, there was also a lot of issues around housing that was very concerning for her. She uh, was in the process of being evicted and she had no idea where she was going to go. So the songs ended up being a way for her to really express and channel the negative emotions and fearful emotions that she had in a positive way. Um, I think Hospital Holiday certainly captures some of the humour and flippancy and spontaneity of Alice's approach um, to masking and managing her fears, but the song also allowed her to explore and express her frustrations of being in hospital. She longed to go home, but she was totally insecure. She didn't know where she was going to go. She had no idea what the future was going to hold for her. But by reflecting on the lyrics together, she was able to acknowledge and start to verbalise her fears in a less fearful way. And this allowed us to explore and consider different coping strategies together. In summary, Ali did report improved mood both during and after sessions. And then before she actually left the hospital, we did a performance to the ward uh, patients and staff. They came and listened and there was applause and people singing along. And after this, she was high as a kite, absolutely beside herself how sort of emotionally strong she felt after this. So she really felt that she'd accomplished something that she never dreamed that she would have done in the past. I think that was really powerful for her. The next case study is um, of another man who also had brain tumours. Um, he was diagnosed with a very rare cancer and um, ha has had significant surgeries uh, and complications from such the surgeries. So Arthur was a, a very polite young man and was socially adept at commenting, uh, you know, at um, pauses in conversation to make you feel that everything was going along according to plan. However, he had significant impaired short-term memory. As any sentence length increased or the complexity increased, his comprehension would break down, and after a few minutes he would have forgotten what had been said altogether. But whilst he can make immediate everyday decisions, for example, what you want to wear, um, he would rarely initiate communication and would require significant prompting to engage in activities. Without this support, he would likely spend the majority of his days in bed. Another thing was he would um, quite often default to declining music therapy sessions, oh, I'm not very good at that. But then I would um, ask him to go back to the diary on his phone and say, you know, last week when we had the session, you had really enjoyed it. You know, do you want to go and look at the picture? Do you want to um, listen to the song again? And this would prompt him going back at it. Or, just saying, oh, yes, OK, well, let's do it. And so over the course of five months, we developed a really positive relationship and significant body of songs again. Um, but this time, songwriting was really used um, as a way to capture and record significant memories for him, something that he couldn't hold on to. So there was a song about a holiday with his parents. His mother had deceased, and so this was a way for him to reflect and hold on to a bit of his um, parental relationships. Um, or it was just a song about simple things that he enjoyed, what he had enjoyed doing that day. The other way we were starting to explore songwriting was to use it as a functional prompt. So as a, a memory cue for a sequencing of actions, whether it's uh, getting dressed or washing the whole body, something which again, because of the level of his um, memory impairment, he couldn't always hold on to the order or the completion of projects that he started. So the outcome of that was really quite um, moving in that he could recall the actual lyrics that we had written together. So if you played a song to him again, he would be able to bring back those lyrics without looking at a lyric sheet. He was also really happy to be able to share these things with his father and his grandparents. It was an artifact that um, could be held on to. So I know Roseanne talked about the different areas that we work on, physical, um, speech, communication. So this work really was a focus on the emotional and behavioural um, part of rehabilitation. Um, I think emotional and behavioural reactions can be particularly challenging for both the individual and for their family. Whether it's low mood, loss of confidence and motivation, this also then ripples on to the um, impact of therapy 
and rehabilitation in physical um, therapy or um, occupational therapy, speech language therapy. But not every client is going to want to engage in songwriting and nor is songwriting uh, suitable for every client. But those who are receptive and able to engage in the process, I found songwriting an incredibly flexible and powerful tool. It's incredibly versatile. It touches on many of the different cognitive structures, whether it's memory, planning, organisation, decision making, language, self-expression. And it's also incredibly social and um, pulling together a really um, clear interaction between the therapist and the individual as we create something together. This shared process is incredibly positively well received by the clients that I have worked with. Songs by their very nature have a very structured form and um, with the beginning and a middle and an end, um, but then there's total flexibility within the form. So there's a huge amount of variation and opportunity for self-expression whilst it also holds the emotional weight within the container of the song. Um, I think the other thing that's been incredibly powerful is the creation of that artifact, the tangible object that people can leave the hospital with or give to their family. The actual object and the recording um, can be re-listened to, it can be shared with people, and it gives that opportunity to do cross-disciplinary work as well. In terms of the approach, it's so variable. It's dependent on the client. The frequency is variable depending on what's possible. Um, and the subject matter is always directed by the client. What is the client's song? It is a, the client's music that we are trying to capture and pull out. It's not our music that we're trying to put onto them. So with that, I'd like to say thank you. And um, I'm sure if there have been any questions, Roseanne will have them in the chat and we will be here at the end. And now I'm going to hand you over to Michael. Thank you. Hello, my name is Michael Jenkins, and I'm one of the music therapists here at the hospital. Um, okay, so this is the beginning of my presentation. Um, so, yeah, it's nice for you all to be here today, and it's nice that there's so many of you here. That's really great. Um, so my presentation is not about a single case study. It's about a, a it's about a um, group therapy, and within that. I'm going to talk about several mini case studies within the group. So today I'm talking about um, the Draper Singing Group, which is a music therapy group that we started on one of the words here. So I'm just going to talk about um, the, the benefits of, of having a therapy choir on a ward of patients with acquired brain injury. And uh, I'll talk a bit as well about how we measure those benefits. So just to give you a bit of an overview about what I'll be talking about today, um, I'll talk about the um, patient group that we work with on this particular ward and the purpose of the ward and what we specialize in. And then I'll talk a bit about fitting into the puzzle, as I call it, which is where I'll just talk about some of the different therapy groups that we have. So this um, singing group or a, a choir that we have on the ward is just one of many groups that we have on the ward. Um, every day there's a different group. So I'll just talk about the importance of having um, group therapy for um, adults in rehabilitation as well. And I'll talk a bit about the reasons why we have a singing group on the ward. Um, so for various reasons due to the brain injury, patients have impairments with their language and their communication and their social skills, etc. Um, also, I'll talk about some more of the um, technical side of the work as well. So it's a group by referral, and I'll show you the referral form that we use and what we're um, looking for. And that kind of highlights as well what the purpose of the group is. And just talking more technically, I'll just show you the, the, the exercises and the interventions that we do in the choir. And I have some outcomes to show you as well. So I'll show you the outcome measures that we use. And in addition to more quantitative outcomes, I also have some um, feedback from the patients that attend the group, which is really nice. So I can, I can round off with, with that. So just to begin, um, here's a picture of the hospital, just to give you some um, background of the setting. These are some pictures of the ward. 
So in the top left picture is the ward reception, and the bottom left picture is one of the uh, patient rooms, well, um, uh, family room rather, but it's just the room that we use for the choir. We just push the chairs out of the way and set up the choir. So Draper's Ward is a 19-bed rehabilitation unit. We provide assessment and rehabilitation for adults with complex and um, acquired uh, complex acquired brain injury. And we have a strong emphasis on patient-centered goals, patient-set goals. On this ward, most of our patients can engage in their own goal setting. So they're involved in those meetings where they tell their therapy team what's important to them and what they would like to achieve when they're here. So we are a um, rehab ward. Many of our patients are higher functioning, but um, there is still quite a um, quite a lot of diversity within that. Um, so our, our patients present with a, a range of impairments, um, such as impairments with their motor skills, their motor function, their cognition, and their thinking skills, and also their communication. We also specialize in tracheostomy care. So um, that is a plastic tube in the trachea that helps the patient um, breathe with a patent airway. And that's relevant to our group because we have patients in our um, group that have a tracheostomy and an additional aim of the, uh, of, of the group is to help those patients practice their um, breathing skills um, uh, because those patients with the tracheostomy are in most cases being weaned off of it. So the, the group is a great way for them to, to practice their breath skills. So Fitting into the puzzle, so what um, is the benefit of having groups for adults with brain injury? There is a host of benefits that research shows us. So it supports with social integration, supports with community reintegration. And the second point has been really has been really important during the COVID pandemic because it has restricted lots of patients from going out into the community, from doing actual community rehabilitation. Um, so this is a really good first step in that direction. So being able to engage in a therapy group is a really good step towards that. Um, also, uh, it's a supportive and non-threatening environment, which is created by the group. Um, so the, the meeting that we use obviously is music and it's widely understood and accepted that music is non-threatening and supportive. And it's also really nice that patients can motivate and support each other. They can give each other tips and advice um, and feedback. An increased reach of therapy provision as well. We're providing multiple therapy sessions at the same time for a group of patients. These are just an example of groups that we do on the ward. So our singing group takes place right in the middle of the week on a Wednesday. And as you can see, um, before that and after that, we have an upper limb exercise group, baking group, art group, and a gardening group. So it's important that these groups vary in their aim and scope as well. So there's a variety in the patient's week. So as I mentioned briefly, many patients on the ward have speech and language impairments, such as issues with their posture, their breath support, voice production, and intelligibility, and also language, so expressive and receptive, and social communication impairments as well, which is why we decided to start a singing group. So I didn't start the singing group. The singing group was started by a previous colleague in April 2019, and I've been running it for, I think, about a couple of months now. So it's an ongoing collaboration between speech therapy and music therapy. We developed it together and we run it together. Also, um, currently we have a, so currently it's myself, a speech therapist, a speech therapy assistant, and a music therapy student that run the group. And it's important to have that, um, uh, that therapy intensity in the group as well, because the patients do require quite a lot of support. So in most cases, we can have one-to-one -one support for the patients. It's important that we have a referral for this group. So patients can be referred by their music therapist or speech therapist. Um, patients can also refer themselves if they would like to. And the referral form is important because it ensures that the group is able to meet their needs. So this is an example. So the um, person that's referring just puts some key goals at the top and then ticks off what the patient's aims are at the bottom. These could be aims of voice, um, increased breath support, pitch range, volume, reading skills, um, copying words, et cetera, et cetera. And I just want to go through the interventions that we do. So what I'm showing you now is basically a session plan. We start with posture exercises and then move to breath support exercises and then move to voicing, phonation resonance exercises, 
and then we do the articulation exercises and then we move more on to the song based part of the session where we transfer these skills to song each patient that attends the group gets to choose a song that they would like the group to sing to practice these skills and then we have some time to discuss as a group what went well what was difficult etc so it's kind of going back to that peer support as well and all of these are music based exercises as well so a lot of them come from an empty informed background um, so yeah they're all music based and the session structure is loosely guided on this pyramid of vocal technique which is how i understand um, training voice skills so this pyramid of vocal technique essentially shows the order in which you exercise um, the different aspects of voice so first you work on posture then breathing then intonation and resonance and articulation. So what this is describing is that you can't have good breathing skills if you don't have good posture first. So it's just showing that priority of skills that need to be addressed um, to be able to voice intelligently. Uh, and this is often used by voice teachers. This is what, um, what I remember using when I was a voice student. So, um, yeah, I think it's just a really good way of, it's a really good model to, um, to structure a session. So we have some outcomes that we use in the group, uh, a variety of outcomes, because speech and language and communication is so broad, we use a range of outcome measures. So um, these are some of the outcome measures that we use. Uh, first one is the OSTOMS, which actually um, is, an outcome measure for, for several different domains. So we use the Ostom's speech and the Ostom's language. So this is the Australian therapy outcome measure. So we use the one for speech and the one for language. And also the adapted Kagan scale. And the one that we specifically use is the measure of participation in conversation. So this is looking more at the social aspect of communication. In addition to these three outcome measures, we also have um, informal um, scales that we use to measure pitch, volume, and quality. So it's essentially to what degree that patient is successful in controlling their pitch, volume, and quality. And we record outcomes weekly. I'll just go to the next slide and show you. So this is a, um, outcomes for a patient. It's not, it's not incredibly impressive to look at these outcomes, but it's just showing that this patient has attended so far three times. She is an active member, which means that she will continue to attend. So it's demonstrating that in the first and second session, uh, she uh, had quite a lot of difficulty with each of those domains, um, pitch, volume, quality, and intelligibility. And in the final session, there was somewhat of an improvement with her volume control and her intelligibility. So because she's an active member, we would um, anticipate or hope that she would continue to improve in these domains. There's a bit more going on here. So this is for a different patient who is also an active member. So she will continue to attend this group. I've so far attended four times. And I'll just go through each of the domains. So her pitch control is represented by the light blue. It's remained relatively stable and has improved a little bit in the last session that she attended. Her volume control has remained quite stable throughout all of the sessions. And her voice quality has remained stable. And her intelligibility has remained stable and then has improved in the um, final two sessions and her language has remained stable. So it's just a way of, um, of showing a visual graphic of each of those domains and how there have been some improvements in her case. So I think that's a really nice miniature case study of that patient. And as I said, she's an active member and we would anticipate that, that those domains would continue to improve. So this is a patient who has been discharged from the group. So um, he's been discharged from the hospital, so he will no longer be attending this group. But we have the outcomes of all of the sessions that he's attended. So again, there's quite a lot going on here. So for this patient, we were measuring pitch control, volume, quality, and intelligibility. And also, um, we wouldn't measure every domain for every patient, only what's relevant to them. So this patient, for example, did not have a language impairment, so we're not measuring his language skills. We're just measuring on what's relevant to him. So just going through these outcomes, so his pitch control did improve 
um, during his attendance to the group. His volume control remained quite stable. His voice quality improved and then stabilized a little bit towards the end. And his, his, his intelligibility initially was quite poor and improved in the final two sessions. So this was a man with severe dysarthria, meaning that the, um, muscles, the, the muscles of the face and the mouth are weak and the patient isn't able to articulate fully and be understood by people, especially unfamiliar people. So um, this is a really good case study in which his, his um, face muscles did strengthen and he was able to improve his speech intelligibility. So in, in addition to this outcome measures that I showed you, we, I also collected some patient feedback for more of a um, qualitative feedback for the groups uh, or some qualitative outcomes. Because as I mentioned briefly earlier, music is widely understood and regarded as very supportive and non-threatening. Um, so it's important that we, um, that we have a look at these outcomes as well. So I collected feedback from each of the patients that attended, not from all of them, but from some of them actually. And I, um, I categorized their feedback into three emergent themes. And the three emergent themes were, so their, their um, feedback was related to improvements in mood, improvements in their communication confidence, and improvements in their functional skills. So this is an example of some feedback relating to mood. So this is in the patient's own words, and the patient said, I feel happy when I'm here. It helps with my mood. The singing is uplifting. It feels good because we sing songs that we know. And this is an example of feedback for communication confidence. This patient said, it makes you feel like you can contribute to something. It makes you feel like you're good enough. And this is some patient feedback relating to functional improvements. So the patient said, it helps, me to, it helps me to regulate my breathing. It helps me with my pronunciation. And she explained that you can relate what you do in the choir to what you're doing in other therapy sessions um, and exercises, et cetera. So she found a really strong therapeutic value in the session. And that's the end of the presentation. Here's some references if you're interested in having a look at some of the theoretical background of what we're doing. And that's it. Thank you. I think we'll have some questions at the end of everyone's presentation. So I will hand you over now to my colleague, Alice Hardy, who is the next presenter. Um, so today I'm going to share with you the story of several music therapy interventions that I um, used with a young woman between September 2021 and today. She's still a, a patient of mine. So Anna was referred to music therapy because of her previous interest in music and because she was a classically trained pianist. Anna moved to the UK from Poland about 10 years ago and she speaks very good English. Um, her family all still live in Poland. At the time she was working as a cleaner in London and she lived with her boyfriend when she was hit by a car whilst uh, crossing the road. Anna sustained a severe brain injury and brain in imaging showed extensive right and left sided skull fractures, uh, an acute subdural hematoma and swelling. And when Anna came to the RHN she presented with global weakness, reduced strength and voluntary activity in her upper limbs, spontaneous activity of her right lower limb and no movement in her left lower limb. And as well as severe physical impairments, she also demonstrated really severe cognitive and communication impairments as well. Anna came to the RHM with a tracheostomy in place and she was unable to voice. Initially, she was communicating using eye gaze and low tech uh, AAC, something called the E-TRAN, um, to indicate yes and no, and she was able to accurately answer autobiographical and situational questions. During the initial music therapy sessions, she was able to make a choice between two songs, or two options for songs, and then as we played those songs, she actually began to mouth along to them. And after that, she actually began communicating to all staff members by, by mouthing. Um, the tracky weaning was really quickly 
commenced. Um, but Anna became quite anxious when she was having the um, the one way valve on, and she would complain that she felt like she couldn't breathe, and she became quite distressed when the physio and the SLT were were putting a one way valve on her. So we decided to combine the music therapy sessions with the physio and the speech therapist for the tracky weaning, as it was a really good way to distract Anna and keep her calm, but it also was encouraging her to take deep breaths and um, to do sort of extended voicing while she was singing. Um, Anna was able to tolerate this, these one-way valve trials and actually she was soon decannulated. Um, she also very spontaneously began to, once the trachea was removed, she began to voice um, very strongly and she was able to communicate very quickly. This happened on a weekend and I, I remember coming in on the Monday and suddenly she was, she was speaking. Um, which was amazing to see. Um, music therapy was also used with in physio sessions when um, Anna would be sitting on, on one of the plinths and the physio would be sitting behind her supporting her to sit up um, and then I would use a range of instruments to target sort of increasing range of mo uh, movement in her upper limbs so using her hands to try and reach both ends of the keyboard and um, using drums uh, so she could play along with her favourite songs. So this is just a bit of an overview of the, the techniques that were used during the first kind of six to eight weeks of music therapy um, with some clinical symptoms and, and the outcomes of those. So as Anna became much more communicative with her voice, it highlighted a lot more of the cognitive impairments that were not very obvious before. Um, she began to decline therapy sessions and request to go back to bed and she was reporting significant pain and tiredness and would, come, would become quite verbally aggressive when staff tried to sort of encourage her to sit out for a bit longer or attend therapy sessions. Um, she was quite reluctant to interact with the patients on the ward or join in group activities and it was hard for her to not be able to see her family as they were all living in another country. So the music therapy sessions then really focus on motivating her to stay out in her chair, uh, to attend the session, and then during the session she would play the piano and we would sing her favourite songs, which really did a lot to elevate her mood. So again, this is another slide just going through the, the techniques that we use for the, for the next sort of four to six weeks of, of music therapy. So towards the issues, she's still, Anna is still with us, but she's going to be discharged in March. So we're sort of in the last couple of sort of few weeks of her of her rehabilitation. Um, a little while ago, I introduced the idea of songwriting to her, which she was immediately very keen to to try. Um, Anna displays several issues with sort of executive functioning, such as um, verbose speech where she lacks a lot of awareness of other people during conversations and she has a tendency to give far too much information she rep and she repeats herself while talking. So the lyric writing part of the songwriting intervention um, really focuses on me sort of guiding her through deciding what the song is going to be about, asking her questions and really just helping her to organise her thoughts into sort of succinct phrases that would be suitable for a song. And But also during this process, um, she's able to express her thoughts and feelings and, and reflect on them and develop some insight into her current situation because that's another one of the issues she has she has very fluctuating insight with um sort of what she is able and isn't able to do at the moment um due to the recent ward lockdown we've not been able to put music to the lyrics yet However, um, I really hope that this is going to be the next stage. Um, Anne was able, as I said, she was a classically trained pianist before her, um, her injury, and she is still able to identify and play notes on the piano, and she can sing along to melodies. Um, so I think she'll be able to have a really active role in arranging the music for her song. And she's very keen to record the song when it's finished, and she's got many ideas of songs that she wants to write after this. Um, so I think we've got we've got a lot of work to do between now and her her discharge. So yeah, these are the just the final 
techniques and symptoms and the outcomes of our sort of sessions between now and when she's when she's going to leave in, in March. So that's the end of my presentation, and I think we're going to hand over to do some questions. So I'll hand over to Roseanne for that. Yeah.